the birth of John the Baptist. When it was time for Elizabeth's baby to be born, she gave birth to a son. And when her neighbours and relatives heard that the Lord had been merciful to her, everyone rejoiced with her. When the baby was eight days old, they all came for the circumcision ceremony. They wanted to name him Zechariah after his father. But Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. What? they exclaimed. There is no one in all your family by that name. So they used gestures to ask the baby's father what he wanted to name him. He motioned for a writing tablet and to everyone's surprise he wrote, his name is John. Instantly, Zechariah could speak again and he began praising God. All fell upon the whole neighbourhood and the news of what had happened spread throughout the Judean hills. Everyone who heard about it reflected on these events and asked, What will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was surely upon him in a special way. Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty saviour from the royal line of his servant, David, just as he promised through the holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor, Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. And to guide us to the path of peace. So John grew up and became strong in spirit. And he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. Thank you, Anne. Well, today is the fifth of five talks on Luke chapter one, and we're going to look at uh, Zechariah. Now, the story of Zechariah is really in two parts, and uh, today is part two, so I'll, let me just quickly recap. Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth have not been able to have children. Then one day when Zechariah is working in the temple, he was a priest, the angel Gabriel appears to him and promises him that he and Elizabeth will have a son who is to be named John. But Zechariah, he doesn't believe this. And so Gabriel gives him a sign. And the sign is that he will be, he will lose the power of speech for nine months. Well, fast forward nine months and the child has been born and is being brought to be circumcised on the eighth day. And against uh, some resistance, first Elizabeth and then Zechariah insist that the child is to be called John, because that's what Gabriel had told them. At that very moment, uh, Zechariah recovers the power of speech. He's filled with the Spirit and he prophesies the prophecy that we find uh, from verse 67 onwards. Now, there's quite a lot I could say about Zechariah. I think he's a fascinating figure. Um, but I'm afraid for, for most of that, you'll need to um, listen in again to the Sunday service at Medihead Christian Fellowship on December the 6th. Today, I'm just going to look at that prophecy. But in fact, there's a lot in that prophecy to look at. 
The prophecy is something of a then and now contrast. Zechariah is looking back into the past, looking back into the history of the Jewish people and into his Bible. He's considering the promises given to the prophets and the prophecies that they brought, and indeed the promises given to their first ancestor, Abraham. And there's a sense of that longing of the Jewish people, their hope for the kingdom of God to come to its fullest extent. And then he's saying, and now God is doing these remarkable things. So the things long promised are being fulfilled in Zechariah's day in the person of Jesus Christ. And there's um, almost a prequel here to something we'll see happen in Luke chapter 4 when Jesus is invited to speak in the synagogue in Nazareth. And it's a very uh, theatrical moment. Jesus takes uh, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He reads briefly from Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, Then he turns to the congregation and says, this prophecy has been fulfilled in your presence. So Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. And in the prophecy we're looking at today, I want to pick out five things that affect us deeply and are brought to us through Jesus Christ. Well, the first thing I want to mention is is the, the statement that God has visited his people. And when you think about it, that's a remarkable statement. Um, perhaps think of verse 14 of John chapter 1 when John writes and the word became flesh and dwelt among us or as it's put in the message translation and I, I love the message here it says the word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood because there's something in the, in the Greek where it almost says God tabernacle amongst us. Now, a tabernacle was a tent. So we might almost say a literal translation would be, you know, God moved into our campsite and pitched his tent in the middle of us. God has visited his people in Jesus Christ. Secondly, uh, Zechariah is saying that God has rescued us from our enemies. Now, sometimes when we Christians read things in the Old Testament, that sometimes bloodthirsty things about enemies, or even the prophecy like the one today, we can be uh, a little uncomfortable. We're remembering that Jesus told us to love our enemies. How does that fit with this? Well, I think it fits in this way. Um, insofar as our enemies are human beings, then uh, Jesus' commandment is absolute. We are to love our enemies. But thinking about this more slightly differently, uh, our true enemies are not flesh and blood. They are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And um, we ought to hate those, and we ought to pray um, for God's victory to be expressed in our lives. We need rescue from our enemies. And and those aren't just uh, kind of spiritual concepts, by the way. You know, whenever in this world we see racism or greed or greedy nations or the exploitation of the poor and the vulnerable, when we see um, you know terrible things happening to uh, weak and vulnerable and poor people, uh, th- th- those are our enemies at work, and we rightly pray to be rescued from them. Three, um, Zechariah is noting that God is remembering His promises. Now the Bible has got a lot to say about remembering. And indeed, as Christians, we're told that, you know, every time we take, uh, we celebrate communion together, every time we take the bread and the wine, we are to remember Jesus Christ. And one of the reasons that's so important for us to remember God is that God will remember his promises. And if we're to, in a sense, enjoy the benefit of God's promises, we need to remember them. God will keep his promises. And that includes, in particular, the promise that Jesus Christ will return again, and we will see the kingdom of God come in its ultimate. For um, Zechariah says in his prophecy that God has been merciful to his people. I want you to imagine that you're involved in court proceedings and your case is going to court and you think you've got a good case and your lawyers think you've got a good case. In those circumstances, you don't need mercy. You just need a fair hearing. 
But when, when we contemplate, you know, the mess and chaos in our, in our own lives and the ways in which we've gone against God, we realize that we need a heck of a lot more than a fair hearing. We need God's mercy. And so this reference to merciful is incredibly important. And then lastly, and fifthly, he says that God has brought light to those who live in darkness. And, you know, our natural situation outside of God is one of living in darkness. Um, Paul writing in Colossians chapter one, part of his prayer for the church was, he says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. So we celebrate light and all that light stands for. We celebrate God's sunrise in our lives. Let's, um, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom power and the glory. Amen. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.